Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Did you bring your thinking caps? Because it's time to put them on. Because the conversation starts. Thank you. At first, I didn't think that worked. You know, when I was doing this a long time ago, and I got energy and light workers that came on my show, yeah, they, and they would say, "Oh, you know, let's gather some energy or let's do some Reiki through the computer." I said, "This is some hocus pocus." But you know what? When I take those few deep breaths with my guests, I feel like I'm right in the room with you. Yeah, I want to envelop you. I want to be in your space because you're doing great work. And brains, she is here with us. That is Reno, Reno. 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 <laughs> yeah, Reno. That's what I thought. Reno Morata. She's from Canada and she's here with us on the edge. And we're going to talk about coaching and parenting and building a business and being the mother of a blended family. Uh, a little bit about raising children, how she's going to coach parents. And then they're going to take that information and uh, customize it to the development of their own. She also has a passion for working with women that have come from some very challenging uh, experiences and life experiences. So we're going to jump right in. Welcome to the show, Reno. Hi, April. It's such hey. a to be here. Yeah, with well, me and the brains. Remember to call them brains. They love that. They, you, that validates the fact that they're smart and they're heady. Tell <laughs> us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Um, how I show up in the world. I try to be myself, to mm. be authentic which is which was a journey i wasn't always um how i am today it took me about four decades to find who i was and that was my journey and how it started out was i wanted to have my kids grow up with their own authenticity authenticity mean that's a big $25 word children yeah. can't grow up with their authenticity in my opinion and, and and brains please understand that there may be some bantering back and forth because I'm a toughie and I'm old school okay uh but they don't know who they are that no. has to be developed you know you can't just say here child do your own thing you have to mold them. You have to give them examples. You have to discipline them uh, to a certain degree so that they're able to conform with society. So how do they develop an authentic self as a mm -hmm. child? Well, I think that authenticity is for kids. It shows through passion and interest and their curiosity is them shining through and expressing themselves doing and i think that is uh worthy to note as a parent mm -hmm. and to let them guide what it is that um lights them up instead of us molding them into something that we think they are right or trying to reshape them when they are something that is in contrast to what we think they should be Right. You know, some children are introverted. Some children are rebellious. Some are hyperactive. Some are mean. You know, sometimes you just got a mean kid. Some are some are too kind. You know, yeah. they run up to anybody and they're, you know, no such thing as stranger danger. They're super friendly. So parents really have to figure out, stand back, look, but yeah. also observe and know who your child is. Yeah you know, and explore that. So you said you are a former unschooler. Okay. Yeah. I got a, I got a feeling about that too. Define for me what unschooling is. Okay. So unschooling is, it's a philosophy rather than a educational method. And it's about, um, the underlying philosophy is that we humans are wired to learn we want to learn we are curious and we learn through life and everything in life is a learning opportunity and instead of telling you this is what you need to learn for this amount 
in this amount of time and in this order. Right. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think back of to back in the day when I was selecting a school for my daughter, Montessori, and mm -hmm. it was a very free mm -hmm. kind of environment. You know, if they were really into science that week, they focused on science and they were into that, but there still has to be some basic disciplines. Now I had a, a one woman that wanted to be a guest on my show and I declined and she was an unschooler because not only did she was an unschooler, she was an unruler. Mm -hmm. This is my opinion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Without rules, there's mm -hmm. chaos. Yeah. And no matter what you say or do, us as human beings and individuals have to have some sort of guidelines, some sort of discipline to coast us into mainstream. Mm -hmm. Child is not going to always be with you, you hope. You want them to be an independent contributor to, to society. Yes. Yes. You want them to understand values. Yes. You want them to be able to make a living, to be yes. able to read, write, count, speak. You want them to have social interaction. Yes. You want them to be able to... Um, mentor and mold other individuals and pass it on and one day become parents themselves. So to me, you got to put the work in as a parent. So you're working with parents now and you've got some parents that are new to this philosophy. They're new to parenting altogether. What do you say to them? What is your introduction to them about your philosophy, what you want to help them develop and what you want to help them accomplish? In parenting, we have so much information when it comes to parenting. We have our parents that, you know, parented us. And we have the society that tells us um, this is how you should parent. And now with um, social media, there's so much overload of information on what makes you a good parent. And I think fundamentally, everyone wants to be a good parent. And along the way they lose what it is that is genuinely important to them which is um, it should be based upon their values and that's where i think authenticity is built upon is from your values right but see you have to establish values yeah. you don't have anything to compare it to that's what i'm saying you've got to be you don't know good from bad until you've experienced both. You don't know pain from pleasure until you've experienced both. But I get what you're saying. I totally mm -hmm. get what you're saying. Okay, so now you are a mother of five. Three of your biological children and two um, bonus children. Yeah. Blended families. Yes. Girl is a trip because I got one. <laughs> <laughs> one, one side of it worked out fabulously. The other side, uh, not so well. Mm -hmm. There's jealousy, there's insecurity, there's, uh, you know, there's competition. You know, when you go, when you have a blended family, when they go back to their parents, oh, this is what I did at daddy's house. And mm -hmm. then when they're at daddy's, well, mommy lets me do this. You know, there's manipulation. Uh, there's pain. Sometimes it can be a joy. Because like I said, you know, I got a blended family, you got a blended family, and it's great to bring in, in both sides. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people that are, are struggling with that right now? The blended family... Um, I think it really does take time. And while we all are a family together, I think we, it doesn't need to be rushed to be blended. Mm -hmm. um, I think just for the sake of more peacefulness for the kids, that they know that we're still for them. And I think it's important when things come up um, well, my husband and I, we deal with it um, separately with our biological kids. We talk to them separately when need be, just so they know it's a safe place for them to express their feelings and thoughts. Do you talk separately to the blended children? Um, it all depends. It really depends um, if it's something that like anyone would think it's um, rude, like including my own kids, if they snap at my husband, that's not, that's not um, acceptable for any given situation. For those kind of um, scenarios, we can say whatever uh, we think we should. But if it's more of a lingering, ongoing situation, my husband and I would talk about it 
um, behind closed doors and we would discuss, should we approach this together or should we approach this um, separately? And right. yeah. And it depends on how the child will respond. If they're very tender and very delicate, you don't want to seem like you're double, you know, you're tagging no, exactly, them. Exactly, exactly. You know? You don't want to do that. You don't want to, uh, but you got to let them know that you are serious. Okay. Because you don't come to my house mm-hmm. on a weekend pass and tell me I'm not your mama and move your neck and all this stuff you're going to do. No, you will be in timeout. Okay. But, and um, I, and I it um, credit that all five of them are very respectful. So, um, yeah, we're not like immediate family right away or we're not like best buddies or anything, but we do respect each other and we um, treat each other respectfully. And that's that's how it's been from pretty much day one. Now, let me ask a question from the diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective. Uh, is your husband Asian? What is his nationality? Hmm? Caucasian. Okay. And then, so your children are Caucasian and Asian and My- his... My kids are um, Japanese and their father is Taiwanese. Okay. So Asian, Asian. Or just Asian. Okay. All right. Because sometimes there's a lot of cultural differences there. There is. There absolutely is. You know, and so you have to be aware of that too. You have to be, and you have to be respectful of that. Yes. Because, you know, Asian cultures are a little bit more, again, in my ex- experience, and I've had a lot of experience, I've traveled and lived uh, a little bit more subdued. They have a different strategy. Yeah. Where Americans, white, black, Mexican, we have a different philosophy where we're more outgoing, we're more, uh, we speak our mind, uh, or you get away with a little bit more. You know, you can say some things that you normally couldn't say to your elders in an Asian culture. That's so true. You want, you want to educate, okay? And that's what I said, you know, education is important, it's tender, it's delicate, mm-hmm. it's not in your face, it's an understanding, it's questioning, mm-hmm. it's answering. So I totally get that. Uh, when dealing with, in my situation, a blended family, you got them others, them them exes, <laughs> and they're exes for a reason. It didn't work out with you and them, and right. that's okay. Right. But when they try to meddle, mm. it's hard. So I have a great relationship mm. with my uh, oldest son's mother. We, you know, we put on our big girl panties and we worked it out. Mm. You know, we said, look. This is where we disagree. This is where we do agree. And this is the middle. And now we're madly in love where there's another situation that is not that, that delicate. And this person wants to have an influence, wants to have a say, wants to have a control. But a lot of times in all honesty, that's, they're still in love with your spouse, you know, and you can't help that. So then there's jealousy and insecurity, and all these things. And they use the children as a pawn. What would you say to that mother right now that's struggling with that? I know. <laughs> I know. I'm not that person, but um, I would assume there may be a certain amount of um, fear, perhaps, mm-hmm. that um, the other parent may have a bigger influence or you're not having control is scary. So, I mean, I would ideally, you know, both parties could sit at a table and be able to be honest and open about what it is that's bothering them so much. You know, it might be a perceived danger rather than a real threat. But, you know, that's very, very, I understand, it's very idealistic. It is, Um, but you have to grow into that maturity if you care about the child. Yes. At a certain point, if you're not in that relationship anymore, it's not about you, baby. No. It's not about you. It's about the development of this individual. Yes, it is. It is. And kids pick it up regardless of you talking about the other parent or not. They, they, we call it non-verbal language, non-verbal, non-language, what is it? Communication. Right. For a reason. So it's not just words, but we give out vibes and like eye rollings or facial expressions and whatnot. Uh, You know, and destructive behavior too. You know, we're talking, the conversation now might be centered around anywhere between three and eight. 
But when you get between 9 and 17, you turn into a whole different person because you have these outside influences. Right, you've got right. social media. You've got your friends. You're overhearing conversations. You're developing your own you know, set of values. You're going to school. So there's a lot that's contributed there. Mm-hmm. Talking about, um, you know, that age group between 9 and 17, they're just, they're establishing their own independence. I had a friend that came to me the other day and told me that her daughter asked her for the first time, what is gay? We don't want to talk about that. Well, that's your, in my opinion, that's your first mistake. Because when your child presents you with an opportunity, and I call it an opportunity, uh, you got to jump on it. You don't have to go into the history of this, that, and the other. Answer the question. After you answer one or two questions, they're on to something else. Mm-hmm. But I think that you should be real, that you should not shield your child from real life experiences because one day they're going to have to step outside the door and mm-hmm. face that, be it racism, sexism, classism, you know, uh, difference in education, difference in culture, all these things. What do you say to those parents? If the kids hit you with a question that you can't answer, I think it's really okay to tell the kids, I actually don't know. Let me look into it and I'll get back to you. But the thing is, just in my opinion, you know, you're lying to them. Because if you have lived on this earth and you are their parent, I I don't know what it is that you couldn't share with them, you know, that that you don't know or, or I'll get back to you. It's like stalling. You have the opportunity right then to break the ice to say, okay, look, you know, Gay, this, you know, I say it's happy. <laughs> you know, it, it's happiness. It's a lifestyle. It's how people feel. You know, I don't have to go into how they, you know, get down and all that. We treat everybody for yeah. their heart. Yeah. yeah. So there's basic conversations that you can have with kids. Yeah. But a lot of times parents yeah. shield that. Again, like you say, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you because they're shocked. They are shocked. And, you know, I think it's better to you know, be honest about how you reacted at that point and then really honestly, you know, truthfully get back to them, you know, do reflect on, you know, what it was that shocked you so much. But yeah, I'm not saying that, you know, don't talk to them about it. You like talk to them about anything like experience, you know, why your marriage broke down, you know, just talk about your experience. I, there, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, honesty is always, always, I think it's You got to be honest with them. You have to, because the world is going to pull back the layers of those onions and it stinks and it makes your eyes water. Yes. Yeah. And I would much rather for my child to hear it from me, mm-hmm. that's me, than to hear it from the world. I agree. Because the world is going to distort it and they're going to shape it and color it to suit their needs. Yeah. It's not all rainbows and, you know, puppy dogs and you know whatever they call it, lollipops life i wish it isn't hard but it could be and it most likely will be so i think showing the human aspect of you know yourself as a parent you're a human before anything else right and it, being honest and telling them hey i've had some of these similar experiences right you know? Uh, I experimented with drugs or I snuck out the window to be with some boy and make out in the back of a car. But this is what I've learned from that experience. And I want to share that with you. When the time comes. And and then I turn around and say, okay, so what was your experience? What happened? (laughs) You know, I think the honesty part is really working out because uh, my eldest son, he is 17 she's very honest and open with me. And sometimes as a mom, it's like, you want to share that with your mom, but you know, he's honest. He is. And you know what? It's a blessing that he trusts you. Hmm. Trust is paramount. Yes. My mother would tell me from my little kids, she says, baby, I don't care if you murdered somebody, if you robbed a bank. She said, please always tell mommy the truth because I'm in your corner and I'm going to help you no right. matter what. Right. And they want to know that they have someone to go to. Yeah. Look at how many kids are out there on the streets. I saw a bunch of them on the streets of Hollywood and I was in tears. They were probably from the age of 12 to 17. 
drugs, dirty, hungry, rebellious, but they had a camaraderie because they were there together. They mm -hmm. trusted one another. Mm -hmm. And trust is contingent on something else. If you do this, you break my trust. If I do that, you can't trust me. So what you have to do is keep that dialogue open, even if it's shocking, because your kids are going to shock you. You're going to see things. You're going to overlook things. What do you think about a child's privacy? How much privacy do you think that they should actually have? Plenty. That's a tough one. Hmm? Plenty. I think they really their privacy. Mm -hmm. And that is also, I think, is based upon trust. Mm -hmm. And trust is, it's an action. You know, it's not a given. Um, I think we as parents need to give them a reason to trust us. We need to be very consistent with what we say and do to build that trust and gain that trust. And if you have that trust, and have an interaction with their kids on a very fair basis, then they'll trust you and you will know when they're facing problems or issues. And you know, you can ask them questions and you know, maybe they'll answer you, maybe they won't, but you know, just. Well, I'm an observer. Yeah. I don't, I don't miss much. I watch everything. Hmm. There's a situation that's going on right now. I won't tell exactly what it is and it's not with my kid mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm gonna sit back and just watch mm -hmm. i'm gonna give it three months just to see how it works out right and then i'm gonna pounce on it like tigger <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but again privacy fine. privacy within reason you can't be in my house mm -hmm. and shut your door and lock your door i have no access i am mm -hmm. not gonna pay your cell phone bill and have no access i'm not going to um let you hang out with certain people or have certain people in my house and I don't know who they are. Mm. I think that your privacy evolves upon your maturity. Mm. And as I see things develop and I observe, oh, okay, well, you know, I smell pot, but I don't smell it on my kid. Who are you hanging around? Okay, so let's check. Uh, you know, always have the backpack, can't see the backpack. Bring your backpack in here and open it in front of me. Let's look at your social media together. Because people are, in some situations, are treating their children like an adult. And you're not an adult. You're not grown till you got your own. And I think that that should be monitored. Because what's happening, as I see, is that these children are straying away. And then they get caught up in these weird things like cyberbullying. I, you know me, I'll just unblock you and be done with it. But feeding into that, being lured away from your parents, uh, you know, sexual promiscuity. Here in San Diego, there is a lot of sex trafficking. Sex trafficking. Uh, young girls that are, the gang members are putting them what they call on the blade, where they have them turn 30, 40 tricks, you know, instead of doing drugs. So there's a lot going on. And with that privacy, uh, depression kind of sets in too because they're suppressing all this in their head. So again, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I give that out sparingly. Like I give out trust. I give it as it's earned. But as well, your child will give you what you deserve as well. So tell me about your coaching and tell me about the wonderful things that you're doing with women and with parentings in your new program. Well, the easiest way to say it would be um, to help let go of parenting guilt on a daily basis because it is tiring. So that would be where I would start. But eventually it is about you becoming you. What is it? What are some of the, the, the things that parents and parents are experiencing when you say guilt? What are they, they feeling bad? Not having enough time, uh, not understanding the math. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, uh, yeah, they teach it differently nowadays. Yes, I, I don't know what it is. You know, that or, um, you know, what are, what are some of the parents feeling guilty about? They feel guilty about being strict, which I find um, a little bit confusing. I think there is a line between being strict and abusive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and children want, they want to be reeled in, believe it or not. 
They want someone to say, oh, you know, be careful, don't do that, or this, that, because that shows an element of care. But sometimes being strict can just be obsessive and controlling. Mm, you know? So there is a fine I don't line. believe in corporal punishment. No. I, I, I don't know. I've had to tap that ass one or two times. I'm not going to lie. Okay, <laughs> but... Yeah, I'm yeah, well, yeah, you know, I had to, yeah, I had to do it because you were not listening. Timeout didn't work. This didn't work. Right. This, but a little tap on that behind and, you know, that, you know, but, you know, beating a child, extension cords. Uh, no, I, had a friend, no. I had a friend that her father would make her kneel on rice. And I was, I, I couldn't believe torture, but there's got to be a strategy. Children have to understand that there is an act, a, 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 there's an action, a reaction for every action, and there's consequences. Mm -hmm. And if you stick that fork in the light socket, you're going to get shocked. And I don't, <laughs> told, I don't told you 20 times, don't do it. I don't want you to get shocked. But again, if I have to tap your behind to let you know that, you know, I'd rather sting you on this side than sting mm -hmm. you on the other, that's mm -hmm. fine. So what are some of your, your rules for, for disciplining in this environment children because they do need discipline they do i think i was very strict when they were small actually because if you could reason with a two-year-old that's great but i don't <laughs> think that's reasonable for us to think that you can talk and sit down with a two-year-old three-year-old and talk sense into them and those times it's more of a real danger and threat so I don't see why there could be a black and white in those situations. It's a no because it's a no. There's because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to understand, but I'm saying no because I know it's dangerous. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But there are many parents who struggle that gentle parenting is a thing now. So they want to be gentle in raising their children, but but you should shout and scream if your child runs into the street where there are cars running. You know, you don't want to gently, you know, talk them back into the sidewalk. And they feel guilty about screaming and yelling for the safety of their child. And that is a little bit confusing for me. That's not gentle parenting, in my opinion. But there's only so, again, there's only, there is, you know, in my opinion, that is gentle parenting. Because again, like I said, I have a, a, a friend that her father would make her kneel on rice. I, I, can't imagine, yeah, I can't imagine how those rice grains would feel in your knees, you know, and, and to be torturous. Gentle does not mean that you cannot raise your voice. No, it doesn't. Your voice inflection uh, tells a lot about where you are and your demeanor. Mm -hmm. If you're super soft all the time, your children are going to take that sometimes uh, to their advantage and to your disadvantage. Uh, I don't, I can't stand parents that curse at their kids. I was in the store and this woman was talking to her child like, I, you know, and I wanted to say something and, you know, I bit my tongue because I knew I'd have to be in an issue with her. But you don't talk to your children like that because that's verbal abuse. And that verbal abuse can be equal to or greater than physical abuse. It's long lasting. Oh, you're nothing. You're this, you're that. You're just like your father or you're just like your mother. You know, you're not allowing them to be who they are. And then they set, it sets up resentment every time they look at their father. Oh my God, am I like this person when I was acting out a certain kind of way and I see this person. Now there's a parallel that is, is uh, created between the two. Mothers have a hard time re-engaging and because um, there's a lot of responsibility put on the mother mm -hmm. more so than the father there's great fathers out there father brains i'm not picking on you but you know as far as mothers there are women that um i worked with previously that are re-entering into the family life after being incarcerated or being in a drug program their children don't respect them because they've had challenges you know, you might have had to steal those steaks to feed that child. You might have had to turn that trick to pay the rent. You might have had to, you know, you, you had drug or alcohol problems because it's generational. What do you say to those mothers? How do they begin to find themselves and then build that bridge with their children? 
Oh, that's, um, I think that's many layers. Um, I think there's a path that goes, let's, let's move forward path would be coaching. And, but I think at one point, there needs to be healing happening at the past within yourself, with yourself. Lots of forgiving, probably. You may not forgive, but maybe forgive yourself for not forgiving. But I think if you want to move forward, that takes a lot of strength already to stand in that point of, I want to do better or I want to get out of this. I think it takes tremendous strength from within. So, well, it, you know, it takes like, internal, it takes internal strength, but that strength comes from support. So there's great people like you, alone. Reno, right? There are great yeah. people like you, Reno, that are really, you know, taking the time to help people investigate, research who they are, develop who they are, mm -hmm. and then pour that into something wonderful like their children. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of struggles out there. Yeah. Um, and there's, again, there's a lot of resources and a lot of times people don't want quote unquote group group therapy because right. they're trying to find themselves. They want something very intimate, very personal, very one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are people that like feeding off of each other and I can get suggestions from you and I can build a network of people that I can rely on and resources. So it just depends on where you are brains, but you got to figure that out. Reno can't do that for you. You got to know what your want is, what your desire is. When you look into that child's eyes, what is the reflection that you want to see back? Is it joy? Is it happiness? Is it prosperity? Is it, you know, is it fun? You know, or is it, you know, you want to get out of the chaos? Some parents resent their children and I keep it 100. Everybody is not made to be a parent. I know one young woman right now that has 10 children and all of them are in foster care. And she's pregnant again. What's that all about? I don't know. Am I judging? Absolutely, Brains. I tell you all the time, I judge. <laughs> Y'all get mad at me if you want to. That is the way. I'm not judging her in a way that dishonors her. I'm judging her in a way to give me tools to edit and filter and to see where my boundaries are, how I might be able to support her, what her needs are. That's where my judgment is coming from. So let me clarify that. But 11 children, you don't have any of them. Okay, so what? What? I don't understand that conversation. It's of no benefit to these children to be taken away as soon as they're born. Maybe she enjoys being pregnant. Be a surrogate, you know, but create a foundation for your family, for your home. There's a basis. There's a lot of strange stuff going on out there. So tell me um, a little bit more about your program, what you're doing, and how my brains can get in contact with you. Well, I do have a website. It's called Parenting in Harmony. And that's where you can find me. We can work together. And I only have one program, which is um, a three-month and then another three months um, to integrate what we learn, what you learn. And, you know, a lot of things that we, you as a parent need to shed was in the making 30 to 40 years. So I haven't, I decided not to do just like one on one time, one off coaching because you get very little out from it. So Yes, it's, it's definitely worth questioning a lot of things in your parenting, which will lead to questioning, you know, how you are showing up in the world as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll be more clear on how you want to live your life, how you want to feel about yourself mm -hmm. through working together. And parents, what you have to understand is that parenting is not textbook. It is an evolution. It is a rite of passage. It is growth. It's understanding. It's wisdom. Everybody's child is, they're not cookie cutter. You know, everybody's child is going to be different. Their needs, their wants, your needs and wants. You know, they're looking at you, how you're dealing with your own situations. Are you, you know, hyperactive? Are you stressed out all the time? Are you broke all the time? Are you arguing with your spouse all the time? Are you getting hit or are you hitting? 
They're looking at this. And people say, oh, the kids don't know. If they live in the house, they know everything. Mm -hmm. They hear and they see. And they're not allowed to express themselves in some situations because of, a, you know, it's too strict. And if I say anything out of character or out of line, I'm going to be in a world of trouble. So parents, you have to figure out a balance. You got to figure out what works for you. But the only suggestion, I don't want to give you advice. Uh, the only suggestion I can give you is keep your heart open, keep your ears open, keep your eyes open. Work with great people like Reno when you are in a quandary. You know, so you need to offload this on somebody. You need to be able to unpack it, to get a different perspective, to get a different point of view. That's why you come to the edge. Uh, and I really love what you're doing, Reno. I think that it is very innovative and it's on the cutting edge. People are, again, rushing to talk therapy or rushing to medication or not even listening to their kids at all and just ignoring them. And you have to realize that these are going to be individual contributors. They're going to be responsible for your Social Security. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you've got people that are on top of it. Uh, again, give me your website so that we can get in contact with you. Are you putting all of this together in a book? Are you going to write a great book? <laughs> Yeah, my kids tell me I should write a book. They love how they're being raised. So they tell me I should write a book about it. <laughs> you should write a book about it and share it, you know, and do an audio book because your voice inflection is so mellow, it's so peaceful, and that's what you need to be. You need to be in a peaceful, calm state. When your child is just really doing too much, step back and take those few breaths, you know. Look at it from the other side. Remember, you were a kid once upon a time, too, and you made mistakes. Right. Trial and error. So I think that you're doing a wonderful job. I want to ask you one last thing before we close. What do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered, Reno? I feel like to be remembered as a compassionate person, fair I think it's my values, really, um, trying to understand, connect, love, honest, and compassion would be are my values. So I hope I could leave that legacy behind. Well, I think that you're on to a great start. I do, because compassion starts with your children. They are your template. You know, and they are a reflection of who we are, no matter what you say. When your kid goes out in the world, they say, ooh, they go April and Reno's daughters. <laughs> they don't know your kid's name, but they know your mama's name. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so they know who you are. So let your children know who you are as well. Thank you so much for being here on The Edge Brains. I need you to go like, love, and subscribe to this address right here. Like, love, and subscribe. Uh, all the information that you need, we're trying to pull it together. If there is something or question that you have for Reno, please go and connect with her. Uh, she came on the show. She wants to provide you something. She wants to open up a new experience. Join in that. If it's nothing but a consultation, everything is not for everybody, but I'm sure that she has resources. She'll be able to do that. And she's developing herself. She wants to develop a packet that is really going to be productive, powerful, and impactful. Thank you so much for being here on The Edge, Reno. I think you're the best. Thank you, April. All right. Have a good day. Take care of your kids, brains. <laughs>